So I'm very happy to be here. I'm one of the organizers of the meet meetup in Bogota. Although I live in Medellin, I organize a meeting in Bogota. I come from Colombia, and I'm very happy to be here. It was quite an adventure. I did come directly to Montevideo. First, I went to Porto Alegre and then by car to Montevideo. So far, I've had a great time. So I hope you enjoy my presentation. I'm Sebastián Soga Mosso. I'm Seba Soga in Twitter and GitHub. I work for Wobo Inc. We develop software for other companies in higher education, and I'm going to speak about TCP socket programming in Ruby. So what is a socket? A socket is a way to speak to other programs using standard Unix file descriptors. So it is also a way to communicate with a process between processes or on the same machine or between processes on different continents. They needn't be located in the same part of the world. And like many of you know, or maybe all of you know, that part of the Unix philosophy is that everything in Unix is a file. So yes, a socket acts like a file. It is a file. In Unix, we have a call to the system, which is socket. This socket receives three arguments. And to receive a socket, we have three things. One is the domain. We have several domains. We have the local domain, which is a unit socket, the AFINET, EAFINET 6, and there is more still. There are more still. And we're interested in two sockets for the TCP sockets. The INET supports IPv4 and INET 6 supports IPv6. Then we have the raw, suck raw, then the DRAM and the stream, and then there are others. Now, we're interested in the type of socket that does the streaming because this is a protocol linked to connections. So basically, in this case, we can do this through the TCP. So the third argument is a protocol, like TCP and UDP. Now, to for the purpose of this talk, we're going to speak about these because RULI really allows us to abstract these without being concerned about what protocol we're going to use. So to recap, a TCP socket uses INET or INET6 and uses stream as a type, as a socket type. A TCP socket has two things that are characteristic of it. One is an IP address and a port, and this is done by Unix. So each port in any part should be unique, and these are identified each socket is identified by its address and by the port. So we spoke about the socket theory, but the presentation is programming, TCP sockets programming in Ruby. So the first thing that you need is you have to call up the socket library, which is from this Ruby standard library, and we're going to require a socket. This is very simple. We have the three arguments that we just mentioned. One is INET. Sorry, one, the first one is a domain, then the domain, type, and protocol. The protocol is zero, so that's an optional argument, so we're not going to be concerned about that. So the first is a domain, as I said, and then the INET symbol is the syntax to require the socket constant. And the same happens with the stream, which is a type. As I said just now, everything is in Unix is a file. So let's see how this is reflected in Ruby. In Ruby, we'll see the socket classes. You have basic socket, which is the I.O. And so we can see how socket applies the same methods as I.O. And the files 
are all using the waste. So once again, what we saw, a socket acts like a file. So now let us see the following. In a socket, we have methods available like open, close, read, and write. So why should I care about all this? Well, you have to know how sockets work and which are the domains and the types. This is because as we become more familiar with the sockets, we can start to do magic. We can do things that are going to be very useful for us. It will allow us to do things like writing web servers or know how these work. And this is useful to configure this if I need to work with a configuration that is different from the standard configuration. Now, what is the Sockets API? So, the API is defined the API really is part of it. So, the first uh, call to a system is socket. It creates an endpoint for communication. The second one we are going to see is bind two. It's like uh, assigning a socket to an address. And it says, prepare a socket uh, to start listening to connections and accept what it does is it allows it to manage the connections that re the incoming sockets to connect to another socket. And for instance, this last one, um, to, uh, it, uh, the get peer name. So let's see how this, in, what it does in the server. We, we have seen many calls to the operative uh, system. So we give the socket, we give an address, and this method, the pack socket address in, gives us back a structure of data that contain a port and a host. And then we call the bind method, we give the address, and we start to accept connections. This method receives a parameter that has the size of the queue of connections that we are ready to receive. And then let's see now what happens with the client. The client starts uh, with the same, it creates a socket, uh, an address, and then we give it the connect method that's a binding to the uh, operative uh, system connect, we give the uh, address. And it's uh, important to know that connect blocks something. And now we're going to see that is imp why it's important. And then we can close the connection. So this is so the cl as close as we can get uh, for uh, a system call without really having to do it, because these are bindings that Ruby has to the oper operative system. But as we all know, these Ruby has abstractions that enable us to do things more uh, easy. That's why we love Ruby, and that's why we're here. So it has sort of syntactic sugar around it. So let's see what happens with the server. This is the way it used to be. And here we have another system that's called uh, the TCP server loop. And we, if we want a host, it's optional, and then the port. and. It receives a, you receive a block where you can have access to a connection. It's important to know that the block doesn't close the connection when it is completed. You always have to close it. And the client, that was the code that we had, and now we are just using another method, the TCP, and then between the host and the port, and we can pass a block and to do the, and then we have to close the connection because it doesn't close it alone. Or we have another class that is the TCP socket that enables us just to create a TCP socket, always passing the host. So now we're going to to see to you see how to use the sockets to write and read data. So far we've only seen how to connect. So how do we read? So we just create through a TCP server. We have the connection. 
We call it the read method as just any other I.O. Uh, method, and then we put the data, we close the connection, and the read is the system call that Ruby does, and it's blocking. It's important to know that. So the code that we have just seen won't be complete its execution. It won't give back the control until the connection is closed. And this is important because if we are reading data and the client doesn't close the connection, then we are blocked. So this another way of using read is accepting the size of the data that we want to read so so it's not to be blocked until the the client closes the connection so we give a number one kilobyte and what we do is we start reading the data passing the, the size to the read method and we start to process the information so we receive 1,042, it should say 1,024 bytes, one kilobytes. And this method will give us the control back. And then we can close the connection. So we won't have to wait until the client closes the connection to start receiving data. This is another problem. They're, they're not always going to send us information that can be cut exactly into one kilobyte uh, blocks. So, and uh, the connection is going to to be uh, waiting until uh, the uh, 1,024 bytes reach. That's not the ideal situation. So this helps us prevent uh, such a block, but it doesn't solve the problems. So now we're going to use another method that also has a binding of the operative uh, system, and Ruby gives us for partial readings. As you can see here, we are doing basically the same. We are using a method that's called read partial, and what it does is that it sends us, it returns chunks of data regardless of uh, what has been consumed. So the maximum limit of data that I'm ready to read at a certain time. And this allows us to receive even up to the last piece of what they sent us, even if this is uh, smaller than the limit that we put, that is a chunk size of 1,024 bytes. And then we close the connection. Well. Yes, uh, what I wanted to say here is what's the difference with a normal read that we had seen so far is that this one, when it when you close the connection, when the client says that you won't, he won't pass any more information, they will have an inf they it doesn't stay waiting and uh, to to start uh, returning, but it starts re sending small chunks so and it's important to consider this because you have to capture it to do, see if you have to do something about it so this is what I've just told you how read partial works the problem is that until the connection is closed until the client doesn't close it you will continue to listen but here it's blocked it's, let's see how you write it. It's very simple. It doesn't. It's not rocket science. And then we got to the right system. And now let's let's see how we put all this together and how a server and a client interact. So, client, we have the server. You have the socket and then the bind to an address, and we start to listen, and then the connections, we accept the block, so it is there until it doesn't receive something. So the client creates a socket, it, they connect. When they connect, they can start to send data. So when it, the data is sent, the server starts to read, and you can write it sending something back. It can process information. And the client can read this and can rewrite or write once again. 
and so on, and we read it, and we re- reply, and we are connected and send information until we finish, until the client finally decides to close the connection, and the server also closes the circuit. So as we said, I highlighted three things that are blocking the writing, read, and then the connection. So all our web servers can be slow and inefficient because while we write, we are blocked, and while we read, we're blocked, and also when we're uh, using connections. So, as we know, HTTP works through port 80, so we could only have one petition at a time, one request at a time, and that is highly inefficient. So what can we do about this? So there are some methods which are the non-blocking for for this, and Ruby allows us, Ruby allows us to have bindings to this request of the system. So we have a server with an infinite cycle, and we start to read, and this doesn't block, and we can process information. And now, what is the, this compared to the normal read? This is that when you have to read data, it's good to have an exception called error E again. So we realize we have to receive this and do something about it. Here we I select, and then we have to take into account then there can be a second exception when the connection is closed, and that is E, end of file error, and then you have to break. Now, let's see how we can write in a non-blocking manner. And this is quite similar to the previous one. We create a message and want to write, and we start to do the write non-block connection. And this method will always return a value. This value will tell us what part of the message was read. So what we can do to ensure that the full message will be read, because read and block reads part of it, it will block another message for the following. So what we simply do is how much it took them compared to the total size of the message to see how much was written compared to the total size of the message. And so successfully, um, until we finish. And once we finish, this is what we do with IO Select. Compared to the normal write, we have to require the error E again. And if nothing is going to be written, we do the exception. Now, let us see how we do a non-block connection with Ruby. We have a method. Here we have an address. We'll connect to this address. And the method is called connect non-block. We send this to the address we want to connect to. And there's a difference here because they will always return the exception. And it is important to know what the exceptions are. There are two that I will mention, which are the ones that are most useful for us. The first one is E in progress. This notifies that it the connection is being done in the background, and then it doesn't block and notifies us so that we know. So we connect in the background. Now, this is what is notified. And they can also do another exception, which is EAL ready in progress, which is also a non blocking connection that is already in progress. Now, let us speak about connection multiplexing. And for this purpose, we use something that we already use. So connection multiplexing refers to working with multiple active circuits at the same time. And this is done during the select, which is blocking. So we have an arrangement with circuits, 
And when we call this method, we can include four arguments. The first argument is an array of circuits, which we want to, to notify us when one of them is ready until it is readable. The second one is another array of circuits, which wait until it is writable. And the third one is another array of circuits, which wait until an exception occurs and is launched then so that we can use it as we wish. And the fourth argument is optional. He corrects himself the third, second, third, and fourth op are optional. And the last one is the timeout in seconds. Because if we don't give a timeout, it can remain there infinitely. So the first array are the sockets that are ready to be read. The second are the sockets that are ready to be heard or listened to. And the third are the ones that, with some exceptions, if the time out is met and no event occurred, it just returned. So I, now I want to ask a question. Do you think that this is no good, that TCP is dead? There you have a hashtag. If you have any opinions, please send it. I'd like to know what you think. Now, before I finish, I wanted to recommend you something to read that may be useful to learn about this. The first is a book that's called Working with TCP Sockets, and the second one is called Unix Network Programming. What's the use of all this that we have seen here? All the web servers that we use, including Unix, that I just mentioned, are based on uh, use the sockets in a different manner. Some of them create a process for each connection, so you have threads left. Uh, others are base, uh, event based, and some are hybrid between the different conditions or architectures of servers or types of types of servers. But finally, the basis of it all are the TCP sockets. As you've seen, they're easy to understand. Ruby provides us the way we can reach all the calls of the company, uh, uh, of the entry. So the, it's quite e all the sockets are quite easy. Here we have the most important techniques. If you're interested in learning about this, there are many other topics, such as how to use the buffets, uh, the timeouts, how to do save uh, uh, connections, use, and I invite you to read more about this. Well, the books that I recommended are very good. They discuss the two topics, especially the first one that uh, I showed you that teaches us to work with uh, TCP sockets from Ruby. And that's why I wanted to tell you that there's another thing, that, and I wanted to show you before we finished this. We were given a discount. If you are interested working with the unit sockets here, there's a code in the slide that I can send you via Twitter, and this will enable you to buy the book with a 40% discount. That's all. Thank you.